A wonderful morning to everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Navanita. On behalf of the Bioanalytics Facility, CCRF Ames, uh, it's my great honor and uh, uh, pleasure to welcome our Honorable Director, Professor Ranjit Guleria, Dean Research Professor Chitra Sattar, Subdean Research Professor Vinny Tahuja, other faculty members, research scholars, students of our institute to this webinar uh, on quantitative mass spectrometry on biomolecules utility from bench to bedside. Today's webinar is mainly focusing on the fundamentals and utility of the high-end instruments present in our facility and is designed with short lectures from academia, academia and industry. This is just the beginning of various educational and training programs to be organized by CCRF in the near future. Now I request our director sir, to present his address. I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome you again to one of the webinars of the CCRF facility and this is by the Bioanalytical Core facility which is doing a webinar on quantitative mass spectrometry of biomolecules, utility from bench to bedside. This is going to be a very good addition as to the operational of the CCRF facility because qualitative analytical tools play a major role in many important discoveries in medical sciences. I think the strength of medical science today relies on quantitative data for its significance. People say that data is gold right now because that what is what really helps in taking science forward. And discoveries in fundamental research as well as in clinical applications often require relative or absolute quantities of target molecules for its utility. The bioanalytical facility at CCRF offers high-end technology to prepare and carry out powerful qualitative analysis, simultaneous quantitation and confirmation of high as well as low abundance analytics in biological matrix like blood, plasma, CSF tissue and other body fluids. I think this is something which is very unique and will be of great use to researchers uh, at the All Institute of Medical Sciences. Quantification of drugs and studying their biotransformation in the body gives unique advantage in rationalizing the treatment protocols in patient care. This data is correlated with genetic analysis to really look at genetic polymorphism affecting drug response. And this also helps in monitoring things which are very important like pesticides, environmental pollution, and understanding the pathophysiology of many diseases. Since uh, I'm interested in looking at the effect of the environment, the impact of environmental pollution induced changes in the human body can also be monitored by these biomarkers and one of our groups in our department is actually looking at this in terms of looking at the effect of air pollution and biomarkers uh, and therefore I feel from a first hand knowledge that this tool that is being now used is going to be very very useful. I am sure the state of the art facility consisting of mass spectroscopy and HPLC will actually deliver a unique and unparalleled experience to all branches of medicine and to all researchers. And I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate the entire team which is working on this, uh, led by Dr. Well Pandian for doing an excellent job. And I'm sure you will have a very enriching experience in this webinar. Thank you very much. Respected Director, our Associate Dean, Professor Vinita Tahuja, Professor Velpandian, and the entire team of the Bioanalytics Facility of the CCRF. First of all, I must congratulate Professor Velpandian and his entire team for having arranged this webinar for the Bioanalytics Facility of CCRF. Considering the increasing demand for liquid chromatography coupled tandem mass spectroscopy, that is LCMSMS, among clinical and fundamental researchers of AIMS, it has been decided to bring this state of our technology to the CCRF for the Central Core Research Facility. I am glad that we could make this available to our institute and I'm sure our investigators will be able to make the best use of these advanced high-end instruments to acquire high-quality data in their respective areas of research. 
with this addition to our mass spectrometer facility, we can provide total solution for researchers right from identification of biomarkers using the high resolution mass spectrometry which you, you, which you heard in the proteomics uh, seminar, webinar and to large scale analysis to validate the concept using triple quadrupole LCMSMS. So with the help of this facility, pharmacokinetics and metabolism of drugs, drug interactions, toxic concentration of drugs, absorption related lack of clinical efficacy of drugs can all be attempted comfortably. Soon to this facility, we will be adding HPLC and preparative chromatography instruments to augment their needs in research. Flash chromatography will also be uh, added which will be highly helpful in the isolation of analytes from urine, natural products and milligram quantities with required purity to create standards with their uh, structure characterization. So this is going to be a high-end instrument uh, facility and I encourage that all researchers and faculty and students make use of this facility. Needless to mention, the committee for uh, this facility is, has exceptional expertise in this area and I'm sure that with their help, you can plan the research and make maximum advantage of this facility within the institute. The uh, instruments are in place and once a few other administrative nitty-gritties are taken care of, you should be ready to start. You can have your bookings on the webinar. The charges are getting streamlined and you will be able to plan the experiments with the uh, committee and the scientists and the faculty in the committee of this facility. So I invite you all to make this use of this facility and in today's webinar you will get a very good insight into the fundamentals, process and applications regarding LCMS-MS in bioanalytical experiments. Once again I congratulate Professor Velpandian and his team and I wish them all the best. Thank you, ma'am, for your thoughtful insights. Now we are moving towards our uh, lecture series, uh, starting with the uh, fundamentals of mass spectroscopy by Professor T. Velpandian. He is uh, the in charge of ocular pharmacology at Dr. RT Center, AIMS, and uh, uh, he has set up this uh, state-of-art uh, state facility 11 years back there. And with more than 20 years of experience in bioanalytical field, uh, he, his division is providing uh, interface in clinical and fundamental research to many clinical and non-clinical departments in our institute and to many other institutions of national, national repute. So may I request Professor T. Velpandian to present his talk on introduction to quantitative mass spectrometry using triple quadrupole. Good morning all. Uh, now we are going to see about the fundamentals of mass spectrometry especially when I'm just trying to talk about quantitative mass spectrometry, I'd like to explain you about the dimensions of what does it mean. Now, when I look into historical perspective, I mean, it's not that the mass spectrometry is something new that which has been recently developed, but on the way, there was several transformation took place in this technology, and now it has come to the state of the art, which could do interface to many things. See, when you just look at this, right, right from the smallest of small, that is an atom, to the biggest of the biggest of the universe, always there is a search to go for what is there in that, what is inside an atom, what is in between the electrons, or what is inside the nucleus. The knowledge to know about these things are endless. So just recent uh, findings from CERN, that is a large hadron collider, when just have been uh, uh, at, uh, at Switzerland, Again, it is looking forward for something inside an atom by using the same hypothesis of this mass spectrometry. In the large scale mass spectrometry, use hydrogen to make it possible to collide hydrogen, which are, which, are, which are literally flying at the speed of light, to bang on each other to create, to, to understand about the forces which are, which are there inside uh, the nucleus. But when, the, when you just look into the 
called history. It was in 19th century. It was developed to identify isotopes. When men were searching to, when the when there was a quest for understanding type of elements which are there in the earth, then there was a necessity that I mean uh, the term to differentiate between one and another. So when it comes to mass spectrometry, it's always something to do with weight, the weight, the mass. But the mass here is that. When you are trying to quantify, when you are trying to weigh the mass of an atom, you need such a liberal scale which is smallest of small. So understand that the mass spectrometer is just like a liberal scale which tries to quantify the weight of an atom, weight of a molecule, which is a combination of atoms, and try to understand the structure of molecule. In all these places, it plays an important role. The common unit for uh, molecular weight is Dalton or it is uh, also called as unified mass unit, that is mu. There are two types of masses. Today when you buy a chemical in your laboratory, you know, when you just look at the molecular weight, so you see a 359. That is called average molecular weight or nominal mass. But the exact mass of that, uh, that molecule is always that, when you try to look into the mass spectrometry, there are different isotopes you see. All of us, we know about isotopes. I think I'm not going to detail about this. But now you see, uh, the molecular weight of individual elements are changing and on the base of isotopic pattern. So based upon this, you try to quantify, try to analyze, or try to understand the charge state of a molecule to give more information about its chemical structure. So it was started by J.J. Thompson, when all of you must be remembering about the uh, picture tube in your old TV, but you must have seen an electron gun. If you see the back side of your TV, you see a small uh, 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 bulb which is glowing, and that is something an electron gun which throws the electron continuously on the screen. That was the real, real fundamental basis for this mass spectrometry. Well, he, J.J. Thompson, discovered that the electrons can be subjected for oscillation based upon magnetic field, or they're subjected to oscillation based upon magnetic field or electric field in vacuum. So that's the thing that a charged particle can go through vacuum. That's a fundamental hypothesis he derived. And he first devised a, a, a mass spectrometer to see the, uh, to analyze this. See, these kind of things you can see in your television, this uh, uh, the, uh, electron gun, or in the old uh, valve, valve radios. And, and this was the first electron gun when when J.J. Thompson was trying to introduce to understand about the charged particle, which are getting deflected by molecular weight, or for magnetism, or electric charge. The first uh, in a mass spectrometer that you could get from the 1894, J.J. Thompson that's figured out uh, the calculation of the ratio of electrical charge to the mass of particle, the mass per charge ratio, where he first developed in 1897. But what you will not believe that it took 100 years nearly to solve a lot of problems, practical problems in mass spectrometer to bring it on our table. So the, this, this, the, today with the mass spectrometer you see in your lab is having literally more than eight to nine novel discoveries in science. And uh, around six novels are directly involved in the in different different stages of mass spectrometry. So the classical YouTube mass spectrometer, and most of you are kind of comfortable with this. But here the problem is that there's a YouTube, and the, you know the gas, the molecules which are evaporated or in the gaseous state are being fed constantly, and uh, they are being banged with a, a beam of electron. And they convert this, this process converts it into uh, ions or the, the charged particles. And the charged particles which are subjected for deflection by an electric or by a magnet, and based upon the weight, they are being there with the deflection, they are being detected into the uh, detector and it is recorded. And uh, it's always the time taken for the molecule to travel between the between the insertion point and the detector is always considered and it is subjected for calculation of the mass. Always mass spectrometer is asked to be calibrated to make it possible. Uh, when it does, but the, there's so much of uh, advancements in the 1906, J.J. Thompson, uh, 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 Thompson got first mass spectrometer, the number laureate, and second one is in 18, 1989, uh, Paul, he discovered something very unique that is quadrupole, and quadrupole intra mass spec, and that's the one which revolutionized the complete mass spectrometry. I mean, it took such a long time for the, for somebody to solve the problem. In between 1922, isotope pattern was analyzed by Astro. 
but you will not believe it. 2002, a miraculous thing happens that so one of the biggest problem in mass spectrometry was you know, how to convert that molecule into a gaseous space. Then only you can subject for uh, analysis inside the vacuum. Otherwise, a solid state or a liquid state sample cannot be inserted inside. Therefore, in 2002, John Finn and Tanaka, uh, 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 together they backed the Nobel for their discovery to convert the molecule which was in liquid state to gaseous state and uh, the conversion which is possible without affecting their chemical structure. Or from solid state, converting a, a protein molecule into a gaseous state. So all these, these two inventions and along with J.J. Thompson and Paul, now the mass spectrometer is completely, uh, completely available. Now let us understand what is there inside the mass spectrometer. It's the, inside mass spectrometer, you will see nothing except four pencils arranged in three rows. So that is what we call MS1. This picture clearly shows that there is a further four rods uh, uh, in the beginning and center there is a collision cell. Again, it is having rods and again, there are four rods. These rods are called as, uh, uh, these rods, four rods are, uh, are called as quadrupoles and the quadrupoles are driving forces to make, or they are subjected for radio frequency and alternating DC current to make or to separate the molecule according to mass by charge ratio. So what is the principle behind it? See, let's understand this uh, small figure in which you have got a lot of flowers of different, different, different uh, shape, size and every uh, property. Now, you, what you want is that, you wanted that to be separated out among all. There could be always a possibility one flower look like other. More important is that how do you know exactly the one which you are looking forward for in uh, finally? So you allow all of them to get inside the quadrupole one. Quadrupole one decides the, the molecular weight of uh, uh, it tries to determine or try to select the uh, flower based upon some of its criteria. Here in molecules, we consider molecular weight, so it is getting selected. In quadrupole two, what it does is that it splices it, it fragments it. When it, the molecule is getting fragmented, it gets converted into a lot of molecular species or fragmented ions. This fragmented ion again quantify, I mean, again it is weighed in quadrupole 3. The quadrupole typically behaves like a, a, a weighing balance, and quadrupole 2 is behaving as a weighing balance, but quadrupole 2 does the fragmentation process. The fragmentation is typically achieved by using neutral gas molecules like uh, nitrogen or argon or helium. We try to use this uh, nitrogen to bang down this molecule so the weaker bonds like carbon nitrogen or carbon oxygen are broken, therefore the fragments are getting formed. Then see that first you uh, you selected the molecule based on molecular weight. There could be many molecules are having the similar molecular weight. When quadrupole 2 after you fragmented, when the fragment you taken for analysis, then the, the match between the transition of quadrupole 1 and quadrupole 3 together give the highest degree of precision or, and, uh, of the molecule of your interest and it select particular compound only. Therefore, this technique is considered as a gold standard as of now. So this is a say how, what, what, what you see here is the uh, ESI MSM as the ESI acetyl electrospray ionization and I'll tell you, I'll just uh, cover it into a few seconds, uh, uh, that, that, that principle. So what happens after the molecule enters to the mass analyzer? What you see is a peak on the towards your right hand side, a tall peak that shows its molecular weight. But when you try to subject it for fragmentation, it gives rise to different different fragments, and you see the structures of these fragments and their charge state. Together, there is a precursor ion, and there are some there is something called the product ion. The precursor ion is the original molecule which you are subjected for analysis. When you just fragment it by using collusion it produces product ions of different molecular weights. So these product ions are very characteristic from the parent molecule. So together, when you try to take both of them, which, which, which decides about the highest precision possible in selectivity, in selecting a, a particular molecule. When you just look at the MSMS, or how about with the different parts of this MSMS? It could be high resolution mass spectrometry, that is HRMS, or highly sensitive, that is triple quadrupole. So in today's lecture, I'm, I'm concentrating much, much more on triple quadrupole mass spectrometer. One is high resolution, another one is high sensitivity. The triple quadrupole mass spectrometer, what we are talking now, which is uh, highly sensitive, is a highly sensitive one. So first, when the sample is being inserted inside, 
through the sample insert, always we use a way that you can inject it directly, or you can use it by using HPLC or UPLC, LC, or in nano spray or uh, flow flow infusion. You use any or micro syringe pump. Anyway, you can if it is a purest compound, use any of the any one of the infusion assembly, or you try to use HPLC to partially purify a compound from all other compounds, so it can be uh, inserted inside the mass spectrometer. Look here, your problem is different. You are having a molecule not in a neat, simple organic solution, or it can be evaporatable. Here it is in the liquid state. Now the liquid state ion or liquid state molecules has to be converted into gaseous state, and it has to be ionized. So only after ionizing them, then only you can subject it for deflection by electric field or magnetic field inside a very high vacuum. That is what mass analyzer is doing. So the conversion process is achieved by three of these techniques, that is electrospray ionization, what you call EESI, or atmospheric pressure chemical ionization, ATCI, or atmospheric pressure photo ionization. All these three techniques which gives enough amount of uh, uh, space for you to convert water soluble molecule, heat sensitive molecule, water insoluble molecule, everything can be converted into its uh, a pseudo molecular ion state. So the pseudo molecular ion is now subjected, can be subjected for deflection in the electric field or magnetic field, which can be analyzed as I told you. Then it, it bangs on the detector, or either it is a photo detector, a diode amplifier, or a multiple channel plane. It is getting converted, <coughs> the ions are converted into signal and it is acquired for analysis by using softwares. So this is how this simple thing works. So now I'm going to show you a small clipping on uh, this picture of this uh, movie which is which shows that how the ionization takes place. Electrospray ionization or ESI is termed a liquid phase ionization technique. The mobile phase is passed through a stainless steel capillary to which a high voltage is applied. The strong electric field, which is generated at the end of the probe and in the presence of a concentric flow of nitrogen, causes the mobile phase to form an aerosol of highly charged droplets. In the presence of heat, the solvent is evaporated from these highly charged droplets, which reduces their size and increases the charge density. When the charge density reaches a critical point, the droplet explodes into a multitude of smaller droplets. This process continues until all the solvent is removed, leaving behind sample ions with residual charge. These are drawn into the mass analyzer, mass filtered, and then detected. As I told you, the electrical potential of more than 5000 volts is applied, DC is applied between the effluent, uh, the LC effluent, that is chromatography effluent, and the mass inlet. So, therefore, the aerosols which are getting formed are, are getting, uh, they are getting nebulized, and nebulizer is slowly, slowly that when the, when the nebulized drop, droplets are getting evaporated by the concentric flow of, uh, of gases. Now, slowly that uh, the, the solvent gets evaporated the charge density increases. When the charge density increases beyond the limit, it crosses the Coulomb's limit, it passes explosion, and that explosion makes the individual molecules become pseudo-molecular ions. For example, that a simple drug molecule or a, a bionolite is getting protonated by addition of one hydrogen because the whole reaction is done. We used to use some mild uh, uh, acids like formic acid or acetic acid is added to enable this process now, you get a molecular, pseudo-molecular ion, which is charged. Sometimes you can also remove hydrogen from that. You can create M minus H ion. So, negatively charged particles will be going inside. So, now you got an ion, which can be subjected for deflection in the electric field, which is thereby it can be separated out. Now, let me explain you another principle, that is atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. This is useful for nonpolar compounds and where instead of uh, using the, the, the non-polar compounds are infused, before they are entering, they are getting evaporated by a heated nebulizer, and the heated nebulizer, uh, there, is a, uh, there is a needle, which is a corona needle, and the corona needle constantly generates a charged plasma, and that plasma ionizes, uh, ionizes, ionizes the gas molecule. I'll show you this video. The mechanism of atmospheric pressure chemical ionization. In atmospheric pressure chemical ionization, or APCI, the LC eluent enters the source via a grounded capillary and is converted into an aerosol by concentric gas flows. 
The mobile phase and sample are transferred into the gas phase by rapid heating. Ionization occurs via gas phase ion molecule reactions initiated by the presence of a corona discharge. APCI is suitable for less polar compounds than ESI and of a molecular weight below 1000. And what does the corona mean? When you remove the corona mean, uh, uh, a laser, now the same process is considered uh, called as the atmospheric pressure photoionization. So you can use uh, atmospheric pressure photoionization is used for highly hydrophobic compounds. So next slide, please. Now this is a uh, atmospheric pressure photoionization as I told you. Here along with the along with the mobile phase, we all we, we also infuse something called the dopant to enable this process. In this chemical process, you put another uh, uh, dopant, and that gets excited by the laser. And uh, when the after the excited species, I mean, makes the other one get uh, charged up. The whole process is little uh, time-consuming process to explain that how is it so. In the interest of time, that I'm not going in more in detail about it. But uh, how this is how the APPI and APP, uh, APPI and the APCI, both of them, they try to convert. Uh, molecule in its, in, as a pseudo molecular ions with the action of hydrogen by using a small small chemical reaction inside. So the separation of waterfalls. Now after ionized the uh, pseudo molecular ions are now entering into the, into the uh, waterfall. So the waterfalls, what you see here is that oppositely that is like an electric motor. And like an electric motor, the opposite charges are getting formed by using a suitable radio frequency. And this uh, 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 the DC voltage, you can separate a particular ion, particular pseudo molecular uh, pseudo molecular ion is separated because that resonates under particular combination of this. Thereby, it allows and the uh, and the lenses are arranged in uh, different different charges, which makes that to guide it on the positive uh, positive uh, direction towards the uh, detector. Therefore, the trajectory is getting formed inside the waterfall so that it can go to the detector. So now you are trying to, what you are trying to do here is that you are trying to select a pseudo molecular ion using a particular uh, combination of DC voltage and RF radio frequency. The resonant ion is getting separated out. So now you have the molecule of your ion, molecule of your interest is separated in waterfall one. After that, when it goes to the, when it goes to the further, uh, further it is a second stage where we have a fragmentation unit where the neutral gas molecules like nitrogen or argon is being fed and now they are accelerated and their potential is applied to accelerate them and thereby the neutral molecules bang on the molecules to, 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 to create the fragmentation process. In this process, uh, the carbon oxygen or carbon nitrogen bonds are broken. So what you see here is the fluid is getting inside the charged molecules along with the other uh, when they just collide with each other and uh, they along with the neutral gas molecule, they're getting fragmented and the fragmented ion is getting inside the uh, water pool. And the water pool is continuously, uh, in the, the transmission is happening, a molecule of your interest only goes inside, all others are going out. This is how water pool separates a molecule based upon its uh, uh, mass to charge ratio. Well, the, the most interesting thing is that the neutral molecule, which is this process of uh, fragmentation, what we call it as a collisionally activated dissociation or uh, collision induced dissociation, if you want to call. And this is how once the molecule enters the waterfall one, which separates the molecule, and CID, the uh, fragmentation happened, and waterfall three, it's, uh, it's a fragmentation is observed. So when you just allow the waterfall one to allow a particular mass and waterfall three to allow one or two fragment, what you get finally is a compound of your interest, nothing other than that. Therefore, a biomolecule it can be converted for mass mass. We call as a this is called a tandem mass because you are doing first mass analysis. Again, you are doing mass analysis. That is why it is called a tandem mass. In the third one, the, the MS, MS2, so you can trap it again and you can make further fragmentation. It is called mass mass mass. That is MS3 uh, further or MS to the power one. You can fragment it to the smallest of smallest of smaller unit, and you can analyze it. By this way, you can identify the structures. So these kind of mass spectrometers you work in the unit mass resolution, as compared to HRMS, what I discussed in the previous proteomics seminar, which has a very very high resolution, more than one lakh. 
here this must work this must analyze a triple quad work work with unit master resolution but what you get here is a highest sensitivity to the extent of phantom mode this is all the whole uh, whole sequence of the average frequency and HPLC sample is being fed inside the Mandel analyzer and uh, finally it reaches the detector. And the data is interpreted based upon quantitation series. The different methods of analysis, there are different different types of analysis. You can under, you can try to understand about the whole molecular uh, molecular weight of you have, for example, you have got a S track. And then expect to what understand that what all the different molecules are there are uh, based upon this molecular weight. The whole quadruple one, quadruple two, quadruple three is arranged in such a way to make all type of experiments possible. To make that type of experiments, what we do here for qualitative analysis is the single ion monitoring. Here you can select only the ion which is of your interest. Suppose if I'm looking for it for a cortisol inside the blood, I will allow only cortisol to be separated in quadruple one and quadruple two and quadruple three. In case I am not going for fragmentation at all, here you get a very high degree of sensitivity. Very high degree of sensitivity. But when it comes to uh, selectivity, it, 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 it is compromised. But when it comes to MS MS mode, that is when you call it as MRM, that is first you are doing uh, first uh, the, the fourth one shows MRM in this picture, where you are allowing all of them to go, you select cortisol and all, it goes to the second one. I just to fragment it and if the fragment is being selected as quadruple three, now this combination is going to give me the highest specificity for a particular ion. Only cortisol comes out, nothing else. And you are getting first degree separation by using HPLC, second degree separation by using quadruple one, third degree separation using quadruple three, then resultant is a gold standard analysis. This is how the quadruple works. First is quadruple one, it's a full scale spectra, just according to it, just the uh, auto voltage and the radio frequency and the uh, DC voltage and it selects different 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 molecular weights and the molecular weights are getting analyzed in the quadruple uh, tree and we are analyzing all the molecular weights continuously. There are different uh, the single ion monitoring as I told you that single ion monitoring is something very very sensitive but when it comes to selectivity is slightly compromised as compared to MRM but we still use this for some of the molecules which we feel that it is not getting ionized properly. There are, there are lots of shortfalls or having interferences and uh, some sort of uh, molecules which are remotely present. You know, your sample is highly compromised. You have got less than one milligram strand tissue where you cannot opt for more tissues. Sometimes we even analyze the samples from uh, a small surgical tissue excised out of uh, iris. We could analyze the drug content with that. In that case, we go for single ion monitoring. When we have a little bit more concentration or ionizability is very high, we go for this multiple reaction monitoring. In which you see there is a common drug like amlodipine. Amlodipine is having a molecular weight and it is a pseudo-molecular uh, molecular ion. You could see as a, a 409 uh, as the a protonated form. And the protonated species is getting fragmented into 294 or 298. With this combination, we get a particular ion separation. And this gives a peak and this peak is quantified. So here the most important thing is you have to use the standard to do the absolute quantification. In some of the cases, we use a relative quantification. And you know, I think uh, uh, the next lecture, you will get a little bit of uh, idea about unknown compounds, by and lights, how we try to analyze that. Uh, uh, we will explain you, that nature will be explained in the presentation. Different modes of analysis, precursor analysis, neutral on gain, some type of phospholipids. We go for uh, neutral loss type of analysis, time delayed fragmentation we use it to understand the structure of a compound. And uh, from natural products, when you have something on natural products, something on metabolomics, everything can be done. Almost in this year, everything is possible by using mass spectrometry, you will be able to analyze it, in, especially when it comes to quantitation. But the only criteria is that we analyze. The quantification, this is another, uh, another uh, publication from our lab, it shows that how we did the structural analysis, analysis of, of uh, bioanalyte. So this is about uh, uh, homocysteine thiolactone, uh, which, is, uh, which is getting cyclized. There are, there are lots of intermediaries getting formed when you try to do the analysis by using mass spectrometry. And this kind of analysis can be done to understand the structure of the compound which is coming out. So LCMS has got plenty of applications, molecular weight determination in synthetic chemistry or synthesizing a compound, we'll be able to understand it. Structural characteristics of molecules from natural products. 
at gap phase analysis, the reactivity analysis, qualitative and quantitative analysis of components in simple complex matters, you name it, you name a biological fluid, it could be CSF, it could be uh, it could be blood, serum, you know, whole total blood or putrefied blood, or it is a uh, urine or anything, a small amount of tissue is enough to do the analysis. Of unknown components of importance, again you can do by this. Compositional analysis, even this is used for analyzing uh, compositional analysis in space missions. So those uh, you know explorations we have for uh, 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 Mars exploration or moon explorations here, all those uh, robotics uses the same instrument as the MSLS to do the compositional analysis. However, slightly you know to understand whether the living organisms or uh, there are some organisms live there or not. So you look for for a biological signature. The biological signature means some of the organic compounds, which you can understand by using LCMSMS only or MSMS only. Uh, neurotransmitters in brain, microdynamics, uh, this, this, this can be done, neurotransmitters. Or qualitative analysis in lipidomics, proteomics. Suppose if the proteomics, you understood that you have got about thousands of uh, uh, proteins are getting upregulated. And finally, you have come up with only one prototype and you want to do it in thousand patients whether your concept is right or not. So you have to get into this mass analyzer. This will be doing the quantitative analysis. So absolute analysis, very unit of standard. Relative analysis is only based upon the CPL. Metabolomics, many omics will be able to do it here. So I'll, uh, I mean, you can use unknown compounds. You can use a library function. Many times we could figure it out that what compound caused uh, what what was the what what, what compound caused uh, uh, the any toxicity. Which drug or which of the uh, substances are used? So forensics, especially uh, homicidal atoms, those things we can handle, uh, we can identify by using the mass, mass analyzers. So it's a very versatile instrument. You can do in, there's endless possibilities as far as quantification is concerned. And the only thing is that we need to have a little patience. We need to understand, and every experiment, even today for us, even after working for 11 years in mass spectrometry, for us, easy I think uh, you will be able to, the, so the lectures you will be able to understand more and more of it and we will be able to use this facility which is much more advanced state of the art technology we have on CCRF, we will be able to make use of it. Thanks a lot. For such a fascinating presentation, I know this is not enough to understand this complicated instrument, so we will be holding the hands-on workshop soon uh, in the forthcoming French program organized by CCRF. So now we are moving to our next talk by Dr. Neja Gupta. She is uh, is an associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics and one of our clinical collaborators and working on newborn metabolism. So I request uh, Dr. Neja to present uh, her talk on uh, quantitative analysis in LCMS clinical perspective. Good morning all and I thank uh, Dr. Velpanian for the opportunity. So after having a brief introduction about uh, mass spectrometry, I shall be discussing the clinical perspective of quantitative analysis by LCMS-MS. So uh, LCMS has enhanced our current clinical practice by enabling accurate early diagnosis, selection of appropriate therapeutic strategy and monitoring the disease prog progression and or possible understanding possible side effects on a patient by patient basis. The beautiful beautiful part of LCMS is, MS is that we can use readily accessible biofluids such as plasma uh, for studying the various uh, types, uh, various biomarkers and for any research question. So coming to the application of mass spectrometry in, uh, from in clinical use, the most widely used uh, uh, application is in related to drug, drug development, it's pharmacokinetics, toxicity, and related to the do dose adjustments for a particular patient with a particular disease. Another uh, very widely used application for clinicians is in terms of omics, that is metabolomics, proteomics, lipidomics, wherein we try to assess uh, disease-related biomarkers, which are highly specific, which are highly specific for a particular disease or has pathology-related signatures. And we are trying to analyze peptides used for diagnostic testing. So this is possible through LCMS-MS. 
so let's start with much commoner applications which is related to the drugs so there are i'll be presenting few case studies which have been conducted here in aims so just to give a, a sense of it so first uh, so it has its use in cancers wherein one can study the effect of genetic polymorphisms uh, on the various drugs levels like in this case imatinib drug levels were uh, studied and therapeutic response of imatinib can be studied in patient with leukemia so it helps in individualizing the therapy and in optimizing the clinical outcome likewise the low imatinib trough levels which are measured by lcms can uh, be uh, uh, used for uh, um, predicting the cytogenetic relapse or the molecular response so it is used in cancers it is also used in infections like it has been helpful in studying the effect of hiv infection on the dose levels and is helpful in making the dose adjustments it is also helpful in repurposing various drugs like valproate and assessing its therapeutic potential for patients with uh, glaucoma so coming to the much wider use which we, we are using as a geneticist here is its it, its utility in inborn error of metabolism wherein it can be used for newborn screening it can be used for doing some enzyme assays through targeted metabolomics it can be used for studying various biomarkers for lysosomal storage disorders and it can be used for untargeted metabolomics for identifying new biomarkers and its effect on multiple pathways so uh, newborn screening is uh, being widely used in especially in the western world and now in various states in india and it screen for more than 45 disorders from the dried blood spot specimens and uh, uh, mass spectrometry has been in use for several decades but now lcms ms uh, because it is very sensitive and specific and can cover major many many disorders so it is being used for newborn screening worldwide so these are some of the list of disorders which are used uh, wherein the lcms is used for newborn screening the the ones which are highlighted in blue and the pictures on the right side just shows that just with with three blood drops we can screen for more than 50 disorders in a single go so let's go through simple case studies wherein we have used lcms ms for uh, the diagnosis follow up and for solving difficult cases with inborn error of metabolism so this was a first born uh, of non consanguineous uh, uh, marriage and this child presented with poor feeding and lethargy on day 9 of life and but he had high urinary ketones and everything else was normal he was suspected as uh, inborn error of metabolism and then the msms was sent and it showed that high leucine and isoleucine levels they were in toxic range and it was later on confirmed by doing the gcms wherein it showed the various other metabolites which are related to this so there was increase in branched chain amino acids so the diagnosis of maple syrup urine disease was made so this patient as you can see in this uh, uh, clinical course uh, represented on this graph that this patient was diagnosed at day 9 of uh, life and he was sick admitted and investigated and diagnosed as maple syrup urine disease his leucine baseline leucine level were these the peritoneal dialysis was done and then he was put on continued branch chain amino acid free dietary therapy so it was important here because it was diagnosed and then it was put on maybe was put on branch chain amino acid and then the leucine levels were measured um, from time to time and uh, the, the child was doing well it was asymptomatic and the uh, branch chain amino acids were monitored throughout um, uh, about every two weeks or three weeks depending upon the availability of the equipment and then uh, the, then again child decompensated uh, at, at the age of 7 months was again managed and then uh, 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 dietary intervention was done and then child became normal uh, with dietary intervention so the uh, and the, at present the child is 9 months old and is doing well so so important point is that ms has been used in day to day practice successfully used for the diagnosis as well as follow up of various amino acidopathies and so this is the partial list wherein we can see that apart from msud it can also be used for phenylketonuria and the tyrosinemia type 1 so it is used for uh, making the diagnosis as well as the follow up coming to the second case this was a 4 year old female patient born to a non consanguineous couple had asymptomatic neonatal period became symptomatic since age of 6 months had developmental delay febrile seizures at 1 year of age multiple uh, uh, generalized tonic tonic seizures 
history of episodic decompensation which was precipitated by fever and had hyperammonemia so clearly it was a case of uh, iem with episodic presentation and it was a delayed kind examination showed that he she had some rough hairs so the it microscopy showed that he had tricrhoecosis nodosa and a possibility of ureocyclic defect was kept uh, late onset ureocyclic defect was kept because of the hyperammonemia so then uh, the amino hplc was used for determining the various amino acid and it showed that there are two markers which are elevated glutamine which is a surrogate marker for a high ammonia levels and the citrulline was elevated so this gave, gave us a clue that it is a urea cycle defect and probably there is a defect in uh, arginosuccinate lyase deficiency or arginate succinate uh, enzyme deficiency because the citrulline was increased so here the key marker became arginosuccinate which we did not have on hplc so that is why another technique was planned to be applied to determine the arginosuccinate so it was a possible so the possibility of ass or asl deficiency was kept and we needed arginosuccinate marker to uh, uh, levels and it was done by using lcms ms which showed that it was elevated in plasma level in plasma as well as in the urine so generally the, the ass levels may not be detectable in plasma and they are detectable only in urine but LCMS CMS MS is uh, helpful in detecting very low amount in uh, plasma, which is not possible by ion exchange chromatography. So the final diagnosis of ASL deficiency was made by molecular testing, and the prenatal diagnosis was possible in the next pregnancy. So, uh, so coming to the next category, that is the use of uh, LCMS MS in studying the large molecules, which is uh, for lysosomal storage disorder, which is also known as targeted metabolomics. So, lysosomal storage disorders are more than they, are, uh, they include more than fifty disorders, which are linked to lysosomes, and they are uh, they manifest because of the deficiency of these enzymes, which can be picked up by LCMS MS. And you have certain biomarkers that are generally the substrate of these deficient enzymes upstream and then uh, like dicosphingosine for Gaussian disease, lyso-GB3 for Febri disease and so on. So these biomarkers can be studied and are useful for studying the therapeutic response to enzyme replacement therapy and for assessing the severity of the disease. So one of these biomarkers was studied as a part of a DM thesis of Dr. Bhavna under the, uh, with collaboration with uh, Dr. Velpandian, wherein we tried to determine a biomarker for mucopolysaccharidosis type 1 using LCMSMS and it gave us a clue that there is one biomarker BN652 which is elevated which was further quantified by using some modification of the technique and you can beautifully see that the levels are can, can be quantified. So this is one major important uh, application because this biomarker has been studied mainly in mouse and we are trying to look at into, into uh, this biomarker for various type of mucopolysaccharidosis. So the, um, one of the important application is in the untargeted metabolic uh, metabolomics wherein we are trying to look at various pathways which may be perturbed in a particular for a particular disorder like in this study they studied the urea cycle defects and they tried to uh, look at the uh, uh, 900 metabolites which were perturbed in this urea cycle defects and this, this was done in about 50 patients so it has lcms has scope of identifying new biomarkers and uh, studying various other uh, multiple linked pathways that are uh, disturbed so the, at the end, the key points are that LCMS has multifaceted use with some uh, technical modification as you know, uh, Sir explained. It is helpful in newborn screening, the diagnosis of several rare, dis common as well as the rare disorders. It is helpful in identifying the biomarkers and in studying the drug response as we all know. And so it is becoming an exciting prospect for improved patient care and individualized medicine. Thank you. Beautifully, you have shown the clinical application of uh, mass spectroscopy in newborn screening and identifying various biomarkers in rare disorders. Uh, now, we are moving to uh, our next speaker, Dr. Hanuman Sharma. Uh, he is newly appointed scientist too in bioanalytical facility with uh, vast knowledge and hands on experience in mass spectroscopy for more than eight years. And he will be talking about the most vital step of bioanalysis, that is sample preparation. So I request Dr. Hanuman to present his talk on uh, sample preparation requirements. So thank you, ma'am, for the nice introduction. 
So I'll be talking about the sample preparation requirement for mass spectrometry as you uh, rightly heard in the, uh, uh, the lecture of uh, Dr. Ninja that uh, how many disorders have been uh, identified by the LCM SMS. But in all these experiments, the sample preparation is the key point. So why? Why the sample preparation is that important? To concentrate the analyte of interest. Because in sample, there are so many things, but you are concerned only about your analyte. So you need to concentrate that and to minimize the interference of the other materials, which are known as matrix. So as here, you can see that uh, the cytidine, which is an endogenous molecule, is uh, the isomer of cytarabine. And to enhance the sensitivity of the developed method, because in a current scenario, people are much more focused on the endogenous compounds and the endogenous compounds, as you know, that they will be at very low concentration going to picogram. So the sensitivity is very important. So uh, the sample preparation is important as far as the validation is concerned. So validation parameters have been laid down by US FDA and uh, recently in 2018, they were uh, again updated. So uh, what are the features of these uh, validation parameters? They are sensitivity, selectivity, recovery, precision, accuracy, and linearity. So in CCRF, when you will be coming to us, we will be validating your method by keeping these USFD validation criteria into consideration. And as you are seeing here, that there are so many parameters which we are going to see when we are going to develop your method. Matrix effect, as I was talking, matrix. So what is this matrix effect? So here you can see from column, we are going to infuse the matrix, extracted matrix, and from uh, the continuous infusion pump, we are going to introduce the analyte of interest. And in MS instrument, we will be seeing that where the matrix is actually is having effect. So in this area, you can see that when uh, the extracted blank plasma was injected, so it was having a negative notch or it was having a depression. So this is known as the matrix effect, it is uh, ion suppression or ion depression. But as our analyte of interest is eluting at 1.5 minutes, so we will not be having any problem in this method because it is not going to interfere with the analyte uh, chromatography. So here in another example, you can see that how this matrix can affect. So here you can see that because of the matrix, the uh, analysis of morphine was suppressed by 90% in direct injection in some of the cases 6 to 80%. And when the case was of plasma, it was enhanced. So both the cases are possible. So how many types of sample we uh, usually see? So the blood and plasma, as you can see here, that uh, there are several components in blood and plasma. And if, if you talk about urine, yes, inorganic and organic components are there. We can uh, have cell supernatant also. So the nutrients will be there and cell secretions will be there. Tissue extract, yes, they will be having so many things. It will again depend on the tissue. How do we prepare sample? There are four important uh, uh, procedures by which we can prepare our samples. One is dilution, another one is direct deprotonation. We can do liquid liquid extraction and we can go for solid phase extraction. So let's take dilution. What we do in dilution? We, what we do, we put our uh, solvent into uh, the tube where we, our analyte is there and we serially dilute it so that the concentration would reach to a point where we can inject in mass spec because as you have heard in the lecture of Professor Wilpandin that mass spec is very sensitive instrument. And what we do in direct deprotonation, you see, this is the matrix where you will be having molecule of interest. What you are going to do, you are going to put a deprotonating agent, but don't expect that everything would come up. Yes, you will be losing some of the analytes. So there the recovery comes into picture. So we will be demonstrating that uh, this into the coming lecture. So here, as I was talking about the matrix effect and recovery, so in this experiment, experimentation, you can uh, you can understand about this. This is neat standard where no matrix is there. This is post extraction spiked matrix. What is what does that mean? The matrix has already been extracted and then the analyte was spiked into it. This is pre extraction. So here you put your analyte into the matrix and then you try to extract it. 
and this is again the neat extraction whatever extraction procedure you are using you put your uh, sample and then you extract it so you get so many uh, things by this process there is a process efficiency extraction recovery you get matrix effect what matrix is uh, how matrix is affecting your uh, analyte concentration and extraction yield these are important as in this picture you can see that Uh, they use uh, different different extraction procedures like um, SPE cartridges of two different uh, chemistry, and you can see the difference between the extraction. So, very important sample processing method need to be optimized during LCM SMS method development. Coming to liquid liquid extraction, here uh, this is the liquid liquid extraction of lipids. So, what do you do? You put uh, chloroform methanol and then uh, biophysics solution will be prepared and then if you are uh, interested in to liquid then definitely you will be taking the lower uh, layer and it is it is governed by this nonce distribution law where kd is the distribution constant now solid phase extraction in solid phase extraction you can have two kind of principles one is analyte adsorption where the kd as you saw in the previous slide kd is distribution constant if it is more than 1 then analyte is going to retain on the column and matrix will dilute and another principle is matrix adsorption in that matrix is going to be retained on the column and your analyte would be diluted so how we do it first we try to condition our column sp column and then we put the sample so the matrix impurities and your analyte of interest would be retained then you wash so that the impurities can be washed off and finally you elute your analyte of interest so there are so many chemistries available in spe and the best chemi chemistry again need to be selected as per the nature of our analyte and here i'm uh, ending my talk thank you very much thank you anman Now we will be having something interesting: the online workflow of mass spectroscopy, which is already been installed in our facility. So I request Professor P. Dal Pandian and Dr. Hanuman to explain data acquisition of quantitative experiments carried out in the mass. Uh, so once again, that uh, you know, uh, I thank Dr. Nagarika. We are going to show you uh, how the sample preparation, which uh, you know, which is done in our facility, and I think uh, uh, here what we need the take home message is that the mass spectrometry is not just like an analyzer, it's not like a spectrophotometer. It requires uh, uh, it requires attention at every stage, every point. It's not that uh, one column which fits into all. It's not that one technique which fits into all. Therefore, every experiment has to be tailor made, and I must tell you this. That's why uh, the experience in this uh, LC MSMS is very very important in analyzing it. And many very many a times that it it has, it has also happened a method which has been set within a, within a, within a week, and the next week we are, we subjected it for analysis. But it is also true even after working for one month, day and night. we were not able to solve the problem so always it is a uh, uh, always it is something like uh, there is always a factor of x which which with we but we always feel that it's very challenging and we really enjoy working with this kind of really a mass experiment is every day is challenge so like uh, dr hanuman we be showing you some of the visuals that how we trying to process this dr hanuman can you show me so we welcome you to the bioanalytics core facility so the machine which we are having is 6500 plus uh, and uh, this uh, machine as you heard in the lecture now i'll be demonstrating one of the uh, sample preparation methodology where direct deprotonation is shown so i'll be putting deprotonating solvent into plasma which is a matrix of choice and uh, here you can see that after putting this deprotonating solvent the Proteins are getting precipitated. So what we do? We 
vortex it properly so that our analyte of interest would come into the uh, solvent which we added then we need to centrifuge it uh, at uh, very high rpm so that the precipitated protein can be uh, can be uh, like uh, centrifuged and then the loading when you put in the mass spec now the magic has started happening so here you see that the lc has taken up the injection and uh, now what it is it is going to do it is going to wash the middle and then it will be injecting the uh, extracted sample along with our analyte of interest So let me show you how do you quantitate your analyte of interest. So here I'll be showing you how the quantification experiment happens. So in build equation method, what you do, you try to set up a quantification method as Professor Wilpand in told, uh, explained in his talk about the multiple reaction monitoring. So what multiple reaction monitoring we are monitoring so many reactions at the same time. So here you are seeing that we are monitoring four reactions at a time. So the first one is of uh, is of our internal standard, and these all other three are of the same analyte. Parent is same, but three daughters. We are using three daughters, and the compound dependent parameters. Those compound dependent parameters have to be set for each and every molecule and the duration is kept three minutes only oh, and this uh, yes, you better explain about there are two things here there is one is a comfort dependent parameter or the resource dependent parameters sometimes what we do is that we try to set the condition where the ionization is supposed to take place again we need to dial different uh, compositions uh, of gases their temperature and uh, sometimes you get compounds which could degrade at the temperature, therefore we have to tune it in such a way so that you try to analyze, this is called the source dependent parameters. Next is, as Dr. Armand said, is a compound dependent parameters. You know, what type of voltage is required or what type of acceleration to be done in the pollution induced dissociation, you try to break the molecule, what is the energy which is required? This need to be optimized. This differs from one molecule to another other molecule. At different different energies, you get different different fragments. So always we try to fix a particular energy for getting a particular type of fragment, and we always maintain it constant. Therefore, this is called a compound dependent parameter. That's what I you could see in this uh, in this window. So you see the Q1 mass that is a parent mass. Q3 mass is a fragmented one, as he was explaining. It can also be called as a daughter. So as a, which you know fragments. A daughter is something, you know, you don't kill the mother to produce daughter here. The parent ion as well as a fragment ion. So you say the both the things. That's why I As Sir rightly said that the, both the compound and source dependent parameter have to be optimized. So here you can see the source dependent parameter which have been optimized for this particular experiment. They vary from experiment to experiment. So there are five or six uh, parameters which uh, have to be taken care of and now coming to the liquid chromatograph part and you'll be uh, you'll be uh, listening about liquid chromatograph in much detail when uh, Dr. Ujwal will be, be talking about it. So a uh, little bit of uh, uh, information. So the LC uh, methodology which was set for this particular experiment where methanol was used as, uh, at 55 percent of concentration and the pure water was used at 45 percent of concentration and the flow rate was kept at 0.5 and in auto sampler we gave a little bit of lower temperature to tray so that the analyte should not degrade and at column we gave a bit temperature higher temperature so that the peak shape would be of good quality now coming to the results what kind of results we got So you see here, at the uh, right hand side, you are seeing three peaks. These three peaks are of same parent, but three daughters. You see here, this is 385, this is 429, and this is 487. Of same parent 505, it is diparidamol. So they are eluted at 
uh, retention time and the peak shape is also very good it is the base is only of 0.2 yes this is our internal standard sulfadiene methoxine it is elevated at 1.42 so the resolution is quite good and the peaks are quite well apart from each other and the concentration which we used is 100 nanogram per ml now let's see the blank so in blank you are seeing it's absolutely nothing is there so no carryover is there so as per usfd validation criteria carryover is one of the important component so we are fulfilling that component that no carryover is there now let's move on to the quantification how we do the quantification so the quantification wizard so i'll be showing you that how we quantitate whatever analyte we had put on so at the bottom you can see the calibration curve yes you can see the calibration curve and uh, you see here the r square which we got it is 0.9982 and it is a linear regression so again i would go to usfd they are they says that they say that uh, for bioanalytical method validation it should be r square should be better than 0.992 yes it is better than 0.992 it is 0.998 now the concentration which we used for this particular experiment we started from very low 3.125 nanogram and we went up till 100 nanogram per ml and here you will be seeing the absolute concentration and the concentration which we got from our mass spec analysis and their relative accuracies so now uh, two more important criteria are a statistics which have to be taken care of when you develop any method. They are percentage CV and accuracy for each and every concentration. We take three concentration into account, the lowest, which is known as LLOQ, the middle, which is known as MLOQ, and the highest, HLOQ. So for lowest, your percentage CV and accuracy should be within plus minus 20 range, and your middle and higher should be within plus minus 15 days range. So I'll be very happy to see this result. Yes, it is again fulfilling the percentage. Mostly we get this kind of data. <laughs> yes, sir. We never see anything which is deviating. <laughs> so, once your standard methodology has been optimized, you can directly put your samples and by using this linear equation, you can quantitate your sample. Sir, before starting the uh, next experiment, uh, why don't you tell something about the unknown identification through information dependent yes, equation? Yes, yes, something which is very, very interesting and it could solve a lot of problems like by using the information dependent acquisition. It is just something like, you know, you try to do the mixture of compounds, you don't know what does it contain and uh, you, you want to know what are the molecular weights present over there. So, you know, you are really try to run HPLC and LCMS, uh, that's LCMS, MS. And you try to create a data which is just like your the data you get it from SDS page. The SDS page, you know, if you just remember after staining, you see a lot of dot dot dots coming up. So in one angle, you will get uh, the intensity, other side is the retention time, and third dimension is about how much is the molecular weight. So you'll see a scattered data right from you know, it's, I mean, appropriately you try to dial the HPLC, and the effluents are subjected to a constant scanning. Every second, the machine will be scanning for the all molecular weights which are present or are coming out of the analyte. So you get a complete data, the, the picture of data. And this data is pretty unique for, you know, if you take a natural product, if you just inject it, it's very unique. You know, it, since you don't know many compounds, but you see that that's something, for example, you are given some, uh, uh, for some experiments where you are a natural product and you are getting some activity. You want to know which of all the compounds uh, did the job. Therefore, what we do is we see bioactivity guided isolation. You already tried to do, you take the tissue, you re extract it, or you subject it from mass and you try to do IDA dependent protocol. You will come to know which of the compound which is existing in that plant is found in the tissue. So that you come to know that well, this, this could be one of the compound which is having a pharmacological activity, which is having biological activity. So this you come to know. Apart from that, it can also be used for many of the other thing, degradation studies, drug degradation studies, or, uh, or environmental pollutants, or in case of our pesticides, all these things, right? information dependent analysis is a very big potential in mass spectrometry, and it is possible in this machine. I'll just explain them about it. So as uh, Sir rightly said about the information dependent equation, which is a 
really a boon to this machine and this is possible because of the iron trap function which this machine is having so we were having a case of uh, uh, of a subject uh, we were not knowing that whether that subject has taken hydroxychloroquine in this covid scenario hydroxychloroquine was came up like there was a big hype so we wanted to know that whether that patient or that subject has taken hydroxychloroquine or not so we went to information dependent equation method wizard and how do we prepare this information uh, dependent equation method you give some information you wait for the mass to collect the results and then you analyze that so here are uh, several mass parameters and you can see the dynamic fill time this is the um, the property of linear ion trap so here all the scans are of enhanced this is enhanced mass this is enhanced product ion and it's a complete algorithm yes sir i think uh, uh, better than going more into detail about i think uh, once if people start working on it they'll understand yes, more sir. about this but you know when we work every day so we know very well about it but it's not something very difficult also when you start working on you will understand what is enhanced what is normal what is the what type of function we get in for trick to trap everything you come to know it's an algorithm how you try to convert the uh, machine to dance according to what you want that's what it is so what we do we give all the parameters which we uh, require during this run and uh, this is final idea criteria so for this demonstration i already made a method and uh, i gave all the uh, parameters so that uh, we don't lose whatever we wanted to look for so this is ems then id criteria and this enhanced product ion scan criteria and then the lc yes in id experimentation lc is very important so here i had to give a gradient run so that the mass spec would get little bit of time to analyze each and every molecule which is entering into and uh, getting nebulized so now coming to the results what kind of results we get when we see the id experimentation when it is over so here you see the total ion concentration chromatogram which we get when we uh, complete the run and here at the left side you are seeing the molecular masses which have been identified by the mass spec so we as i told that we were uh, interested in hydroxychloroquine so you see the structure of hydroxychloroquine and uh, in uh, fragmentation interpretation you see what kind of fragments we can get when it is subjected to cid so here you see this is the parent molecular mass so it has the system has been run in a positive mode so you will get a signal at 336 and these are the fragments probable fragments which you can get if you are uh, subjecting this so let's see that whether we have got this 336 or not so yes we found 336 here and uh, now let's let's find out that uh, whether the product which is going to be formed from 336 whether we got that product or not so the spectrum of the product is very unique for a particular compound as i said that's what we are seeing here it is a kind of signature which you get yes so here yes so here you see this the ma magic that 336 has been broken into 247 as you can see in this fragmentation fragmentation interpretation yes 247 is a probable fragment which can be formed when you subject it to cid so by this we could be able to identify yes this uh, subject has taken hydroxychloroquine and uh, you see it two ways mass spec and liquid chromatography also how where it is getting eluted so uh, this fragment uh, was eluted at somewhere around uh, 2.8 minutes so the taking log p of uh, hydroxychloroquine into picture which is 3 so we expected it to elute earlier this chromatography so by these things we could able to confirm that yes hydroxychloroquine is the confirmed hit So finally, we want to acknowledge uh, our director, Professor Randeep Bilaria, for his uh, continuous support and encouragement, and Professor Chitra Sarkar, who inspired us by her tireless work, working nature. Professor Vini Tauja, who was our all the time. Really, uh, with the support of uh, the director and the professor yeah. uh, Dean uh, Chitra Sarkar, and uh, Sabine, and it's everything almost we have worked in and out to make it possible yeah. for. Making it available, 
I think next week is going to Spark speak now. Mm-hmm. 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 Pujol is going to give a talk next week. Yeah. Uh, like uh, like selection can, can be coupled, coupled with the, the instrument. Selection is nothing but a, but a uh, differential, uh, differential mobility, mobility spectrometry. spectrometry. So this differential, differential mobility separation, or DMS, uh, this uh, can be coupled, coupled with the, the instrument, instrument um, uh, the 6500 uh, plus, plus instrument. And, and this is just add-on device add or optional device. device. Uh, so uh, the so first thing is you need to just put a DMS cell if you can able to see there's a white colored um, uh, cell which uh, having a very small like only one or two millimeter a few millimeter of thickness uh, within that cell actually the separation of the molecule will happen and uh, then there is a carton plate this is a specially designed carton plate so carton plate actually used for uh, new uh, uh, to remove the neutral molecule or i would say uh, contaminant uh, to protect the instrument from the contamination. So this is the one, one technology carton uh, plate. So that has to be fixed and then there is a source ex- extension ring. So if somebody wants to use the Selexan in 6500, which is actually a Q-trap instrument where we can able to do MRN and also the enhanced product ion scan together uh, using the trap functionality. Uh, this is one of the instruments. Apart from that, there are many other um, scan function like neutral loss or picard Scan, which is typical for triple quadruple in, uh, mass spectrometer. Uh, this uh, instrument is, cap- is a very high sensitive instrument, I would say 6500. And this select ion device can be coupled optionally to, uh, and it is very easy to job, like two minutes job to remove the cell or attach the cell to the instrument. Uh, there is no specific tool or uh, so, um, no device, special device is required for installing the instrument or deinstall the ins- uh, this particular uh, equipment like uh, iron mobility cell. So how it works actually, differential mobility separation. Uh, this is actually planar geometry. It is not like ion mobility spectrometry. So ion mobility is different and differential mobility spectrometry is different. It is actually a planar geometry where in gas flows through towards the mass uh, draws ion. So um, asymmetric waveform applied which alternates between high field and low field. Uh, uh, with this is called a separation voltage. So there are two voltages actually applied for separating the analyte. One is called separation voltage, another is called compensation voltage. So separation voltage actually it is a, a fluctuating from high field to the low field and it separates the ions. Uh, that actually when it is applying, uh, then it uh, uh, the ions will be, uh, the charge ion will back, at, back and forth movement will be there between the plates that is the ion mobility cell. Within the cell, this back and forth movement of the ions will happen after applying the separation voltage. And uh, ion, ion will have net, net drip based on its high and low field mobility. Every ion having there some mobility characteristic, having high mobility characteristics or low, low field mobility will be there. Based on the mobility characteristics of the ion, it, mig- uh, it migrate or it moves uh, towards the uh, cell, uh, the wall of the electrode where at, uh, or the cell. Um, so based on that, it moves uh, around that. And uh, whereas there is a, another voltage is called compensation voltage or called COV shortly. And this is a small DC offset between the plates. So this is actually uh, bring the ion because ions will be uh, moving towards the wall of the cell, whereas compensation voltage adjust the um, or uh, bring the um, bring the ions to the proper trajectory so that the ions come out from the cell uh, in a proper trajectory uh, or uh, so this is a this is called compensation voltage or this is a small DC offset between the plates or I would say filtering voltage. Okay, so two different voltages will apply and uh, different uh, molecule uh, or the molecule of different molecular, uh, same molecular of different shapes behave differently or they are say, compensation voltage will be different. Based on the difference in the compensation voltage, it is possible to separate the ions of same molecular weight of different shapes or different molecular weight also can be separated using the uh, this device.
So this is the two voltages, mainly separation voltage and compensation voltage. Together will work. Uh, in addition to that, if somebody want more separation um, needed for some some cases where actually the compensation voltage or separation voltage become same, even though we are uh, ramping it, but we found that there is the same voltage value. Then there is an additional thing we can do. We can apply some of the uh, uh, gas, gas molecule, what is called transport uh, gas, uh, like uh, like IP, isopropyl alcohol, or um, acetone. Uh, these are the very common, or ethanol, commonly used modifier, which will be introduced in the gaseous phase to the cell and interact with the molecule different differentially, uh, so that uh, they, their ion mobility characteristics changes. And because of the introduction of this gas molecule, uh, or the gas pressure, uh, this uh, COB value differs uh, in this condition. So, COB value differs means we can able to achieve the required separation of the molecule. So, increased selectivity of the separation, decreased low field mobility relative to high field, which increases the COB, uh, compensation voltage or COB, and therefore the peak capacity. Peak capacity means the resolution of the peak. So this is one example, like I'm talking about the metabolomics application here, like many isomers like glycosylesis or gluconogenesis pathway, uh, like uh, competing isobars, share common daughter and maybe their fragment ion is uh, same, but the parent ion is differing. And sometimes challenges in ionization efficiency, ionization chemistry or ionization efficiency is differs. So in this condition, uh, this molecule are very much challenging. As you said, the glucose one phosphate, glucose six phosphate, or fructose one phosphate, they are of the same molecular uh, or six phosphate, 260, or for all cases. But sometimes they pull you uh, in the column also. You can you can't able to separate this molecule. So because of the dipole moment difference between this molecule, there is a chance that you can able to separate using the selection or uh, differential mobility spectrometry using that. Okay. So another way is the separation of glycolysis pathway metabolite like three for phosphoglycerate or two phosphoglycerate, two isomers from the glycolysis or glyco uh, gluconogenesis pathways can, cannot be distinguished based on only the imbizate, but their shapes or their structure may be different. And because of that, there will be a dipole moment difference. And because of that, it is possible to apply different compensation voltage, different uh, to separate this molecule in the select ion device. A similar separation can be obtained for phospho enol uh, pyruvate, another intermediate of the glycolysis or glycogenesis pathways. Uh, this is a glycolysis pathway metabolite. How it looks like you can able to see this, uh, like taurine, uh, dihydroxy, uh, acetone, glycerol, 3-phosphate, uh, phosphoenol, pyruvate. These are all different glycolysis pathway metabolite. So these metabolite can be able, we can able to separate using different separation voltage and ramping the separation voltage and also uh, comp compensation voltage. Select ion technology is, uh, also can be used for quantitation purpose. So these metabolites, we knew, sometimes we need to do an absolute or relative quantification. And the detection level typically can be less than 2 nanomole. So very low nanomolar, nanomole concentration on the column. Uh, that uh, absolute quantity, 2 nanomole on the column, less than 2 nanomole. It is possible using this uh, 6500 instrument uh, it is possible to detect using the uh, separation can be done by the selection and uh, quantitation can be done by uh, the MRM technique in 6500. TCA cycle metabolite like pyruvate, lactate, taurine, succinate, glutamate or aspartate, malate. Uh, all cit citrate, all these are uh, like blue, uh, the TCA cycle metabolite. So these are also using selection uh, technology, it is possible to do uh, accurate quantitation with typical detection level less than 2 nanomole on the column. Uh, some of the uh, positional isomers like, uh, like 
humeric acid and maleic acid so this is a tca cycle metabolite this is also like if you see that dms differential mobility spectrometry uh, cell is off so in this condition we are getting one peak that is a it can it has more more both maleic acid and humeric acid but applying dms uh, we can able to detect uh, separate these two peak maleic acid and fumaric acid and we can use this peak because these are baseline dissolved peak and we can use it for quantitation also so this is another example where swat in triple top system was used for uh, this dms analysis same thing can be uh, done in uh, qtrap 6500 so without dms we can able to uh, see some of the peaks but in with dms all this background interference peaks can be removed so in, in removing the interference peaks also very important in some cases so selex ion this also can be used for removing the interfering peaks keeping the um, isotopic pattern same isotopic peaks will not be removed but the other component peaks will be removed now coming to the lipidomics application this is a very challenging task for lipidomics if you if uh, because lot of uh, lipid uh, classes having different species same molecular weight and they are very uh, very problematic for uh, real separation and within uh, say 1.2 dalton uh, q1 isolation window there is a more number of lipid species can be uh, co fragmented in the collision cell so you will get a composite msms spectra or overlap of the fragment peak of the different precursor so this is a challenges in lipidomics application uh, so example is phospholipid so in phospholipid uh, classes uh, separation is possible and uh, this uh, using the selection because they differ in uh, significantly in uh, dipole moment so it is possible to uh, separate these uh, phospholipid classes by DA using the dms analysis and we can able to see use this peak for even for quantitation analysis this is another example where you is showing the separation of glycoside a uh, ceramide okay glycoside ceramide uh, having different positional uh, isomer uh, identical sub only the stereochemistry is different uh, difference being the stereochemistry of the three uh, three prime hydroxyl group so using the differential mobility uh, spectrometry we can able to resolve these two isomers uh, enable independent confirmation and also quantitation this is also important so for quantitation we need to uh, separate uh, baseline level separation is needed so this is all about uh, the from my my side any question please let me know the counter will get back to you with more questions in case of in the question back answer answer hour so uh, we'll get back to you thank you dr sankar Now our next speaker is Dr. Ujwal, a very sincere and hardworking research scholar from Ocular Pharmacology. He has uh, hands-on experience on HPLC and mass spectroscopy for the last six years. He will touch upon the fundamentals of chromatographic separation by HPLC and its application. Sir, please mute your mic. ओके थैंक यू as we have been discussing in the uh, continuous state board and cms events uh, this lecture of dr ujwal has been made just to how are we going to uh, uh, see we always bothered about mass spec mass spec and uh, about its applications but the most interesting in integral part of mass spec is again an hplc either you can use hplc as a stand alone or you use this along with the mass for those who are doing mass spectrometry we call hplc as a sample feeder 
and those who are working on HPLC, they call mass spectrometry as a detector. Now, Dr. Ujwal is going to give an overview about the HPLC liquid chromatography, but you know, it can be worked as standalone. In CCRF, we have a separate HPLC unit for to capture that purpose. Or if a mask need to be used, it, it can be included with mask that we will be able to supply. Thank you, sir. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to talk about uh, liquid chromatography, which is a separate that antiviral to mass spectrometry, as sir said. Uh, in 1907, a Russian botanist, Dr. Mikhail Sweat, demonstrated the separation of pigments from the plants and coined the term chromatography. The name itself suggests chroma, that means color, and graphene is method which can be able to recognize, recognize different uh, separation based on colors. So it is, a, uh, it is a fundamental basis of chromatography where I'm going to talk about the high performance liquid chromatography today. So it's an instrumental technique used for the isolation and the quantification of the compounds from the complex mixtures. So high performance is also commonly called as high pressure or highly pressed. It can be ranged for HPLC, it can be ranged from three, uh, up to 5,000 PSI. Whereas uh, in ultra high performance liquid chromatography, it can be ranged, it can go up to 18,000 psi. It can be classified based on the separation. It may be isocratic and gradient, or it may be type of mobile phases, normal phase, and nubus phase. So in 1993, IUPC formulates chromatograph uh, definition of chromatography, which is a physical method of separation in which the components to be separated are distributed between two phases that move in a definite direction. This figure shows that uh, how the separation takes place by passing mobile phase through the column, through the stationary phase, where the mobile phase can be, uh, it is a single or mutually miscible solvents to elute, used to elute the analyte and the stationary, on the, which is written on the stationary phase. The, uh, these are the types of chromatic separation where based on the uh, based on the type of, based on the nature of norm, uh, uh, stationary phase and uh, mobile, mobile phase, we can classify the, uh, we can have Reverse phase chromatography, where the uh, the mobile phase would be polar and uh, stationary phase would be non-polar. In case of ion exchange chromatography, we have uh, um, uh, uh, pH uh, specific mobile phases containing uh, specific ionic strength to separate the charge analytes, maybe ionic or an anionic or cationic in, uh, uh, stationary phases. So, in si in case of size exclusion chromatography, it is also called as uh, gel exclusion chromatography or gel permeation chromatography where we have large pores and to which proteins are getting separated. In case of normal phase chromatography, the polar mobile phase is the uh, non-polar and uh, stationary phase is the polar. Hydrophilic, in, uh, hydrophilic interaction liquid chromatography, it is a new advancement in, that, uh, in, the, in this field where it offers normal phase chromatography using the polar mobile phase combinations. So, let us understand about the basics of fundamentals of separation chromatography. Here, uh, this figure shows the adsorption based separation in which two molecules, you can see that two molecules are entering into the column and uh, uh, based on the uh, based on the mobile phase composition, the one is eluted, but the other one was stuck. But after optimizing appropriate mobile phase, that would be leading to the separation as well as elution from the column. So it is, it is the change in the mobile phase or optimizing the mobile phase, it changes the affinity of the analytes towards the mobile, towards the mobile phase as compared to stationary phase. So that leads to adsorption based separation. Let's see how it is in the case of, how it is in the case of partition based uh, separation. So once the, the solvent like methanol and uh, it is a, it's a, as we know that it is a amphiphilic in nature, amphiphilic in nature, it creates a double layer, which you can see here over the hydrophobic C18 beads. So it is forming a double layer and it leads where the partition, uh, where the molecules are getting partitioned between the two liquids. As we know that liquid uh, uh, part partition, partitioning is a liquid-liquid phenomena, where the molecules are getting trans uh, partitioned and uh, one, one, one it is getting stuck, the other one is eluted. But the other, the after optimizing the mobile phase compositions, it is the both are, both compounds are eluted. So this is a change where the partition bit separation is happening. In case of size, what, what, how the size, size, size exclusion bit separation is going to be different. Let's see the, it is a separation, it is for, it is utilized for the separation of proteins. The proteins are having a high molecular weight and uh, the size, size, the size dependent separation is happening in this case. So the, the one which is uh, having a high molecular weight is eluted first the, and because of less interaction in the pore surfaces, and uh, the uh, 
the the molecule the less mo the lower in size molecular size which are diluted the delayed getting delayed so let us understand about the more about the stationary phase this is a this figure shows an example of the uh, this figure shows an example of the derivatized c18 bonded phase uh, which is getting synthesized by using the normal silica which is silicon hydroxide which is getting trans uh, derivatized by using the alkyl chain using the silylation reaction and uh, after modifying the uh, particles with the silica uh, with the c18 chain it is getting packed with the into the cylinder and the stainless steel steel which is getting packed under high pressure and that will be utilized as a stationary phase as we can see that normally we can see the column are stainless steel out from outside but inside it is fully packed with the silica particles with the specific particle size and the pore pore, pore surfaces so as we have a uh, wide range of molecules uh, and a wide range of requirements for the analysis the bioanalysis we have a wide, uh, we have a different type of stationary phases uh, also got uh, analytical columns and uh, it depends it depends on the type of molecules or type na the nature of the uh, molecule which is present in the complex mixture need to be separated and these are the different types of i'm not going to go in detail about uh, different types as i already told you the different modes or different uh, uh, type of uh, separation can be done by using different type of stationary phases so this is the schematic representation of the hplc where we can see the mobile phase reservoir getting pumped by the using a uh, pump and uh, the pump could be a pump can be a different type one is reciprocating pump second is pneumatic pump or a concentrating pump and getting uh, transported to the injection port where the injection port followed by the analytical column and uh, followed by the detector and which is getting integrated into the uh, digital uh, dig digitally is getting task uh, integrated into computer uh, digitalize so after this the what 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 are the detection techniques we use in hplc these are the considered based on the optical and chemical property of the molecules it and uh, uh, it uh, it appropriate detection technique can be utilized for their uh, for their can, uh, may, uh, for the identification and quantification along with the run, along with the time so we have a uv visible detector that is utilizing the functional groups which are present in the uh, chemicals chemical molecules and which absorbs ultraviolet spectrum of light whereas photodiode array detector uh, it is a, uh, it is a also called a qri detector in which we will get a total scan range of all wavelengths which in which the molecule is getting absorbed so we have a i have a pictorial representation here for the individual uv visible uh, detector in which the light is getting mono, uh, the uh, the monochromatic light which is getting uh, uh, produced from the deuterium or tungsten lamp it is getting uh, uh, trans getting passed through it is falling on the effluent which is passing through the effl uh, effluent along with the effluent and uh, it is getting absorbed and the light which is getting trans uh, Uh, it is getting uh, absorbed, which is get, uh, digitalized by using photodiode. So here's an example of this example. This figure shows photodiode array detector, which is getting uh, a three D dimensional figure graph can be recorded at particular time. Every wavelength can be scanned and it can be recorded. Based on the fluorescence type of detector, we have a certain compound will be will be excited at a lower wavelength and it will be uh, emitting while returning to the ground state and will be emitted at a higher wavelength so based on the excitation and emission uh, wavelength we can be um, uh, having a more sensitivity as compared to ultraviolet so in some cases of in some molecules cases of molecule so uh, during initial during initial work uh, uh, like uh, development of the method so in the chromatogram how the peak shape should be uh, it is it is the uh, the criteria for the peak shapes which need to be optimized during the method development itself when uh, there are two peaks you can see that x axis is a time and y axis is the absorbance and the two peaks are getting resolved at 3 and 5.2 minutes we will be having a resolution of 1 so the the peak shape should be as we can see the uh, down uh, this figures there it's a narrow peak width it should have narrow peak width uh, the column also having a uh, should have the should have a high efficiency where the separation is happening this should be having a less telling factor telling factor according to different uh, different regulatory bodies it is uh, uh, should be less than 1.5 or 2 high resolution it should be separated from the complex mixtures and uh, the solvent front and uh, this be having a less separation factor
so uh, after developing uh, this after making a uh, different uh, 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 like uh, assuming our peaks are uh, fine uh, good in uh, shape but uh, the method needs to be developed and validated as per the system suitability guidelines so the different guidelines which have been laid down by the different agencies as per U fda or ICH or usp the system suitability parameter is used to verify the entire chromatography system uh, including instrument electronics reagents column analyst which is suitable for the internal an intended analysis the parameter for uh, just now i told that uh, parameters capacity factor in, uh, that should be more than 2 injection precision should be less than 1% rsd resolution should be more than 2 and telling factor less than equal to 1.5 or 2 theoretical plate should be more so that efficiency will be more and the method after uh, getting a check at the beginning of the instruments and the reagents the method should be validated as per the uh, guidelines which is having a 8 point robust for the um, check for the check in the method performance so after this uh, this is the schematic diagram of the instrument which we have at uh, CCRF, where uh, uh, you can see this. This is not a normal FPLC. It is an advanced UPLC. It is an ultra-performance liquid chromatography, where you can see that the helmet reservoir at the top and uh, followed by pump. And pump is having a two. They are binary pump, and it is a uh, it is a type of reciprocating pump, and uh, uh, in, um, which is uh, which is allowing the uh, which is pumping the pushing the solvent through the uh, follow, uh, through the auto sampler towards the column compartment and followed by detector. So th this is coupled with the mass spectrometer. So here when we combine the HPLC with the mass spectrometer, as Sir has already uh, explained in the earlier sessions, in, uh, it is providing, it is like uh, enlarging the uh, application of mass, uh, uh, encompassing the, enlarging the applications of HPLC. So it is a, when that time, HPLC act as a feeder, not as a detector, because we are not going to use the detector of the HPLC. And uh, this, so a lot of experiment can be done when it combines with the mass, mass spectrometry. So apart from the this mass spectrometry, standalone HPLC also have certain applications. So it can, uh, standalone, it can be used for drug discovery and bioscience, pharmaceuticals, chemicals, in, chemi uh, in environmental and clinical analysis. So in clinical analysis, we can perform the toxicity and we can perform the therapeutic drug monitoring uh, of the uh, particular uh, compounds. We can measure the drug levels of the uh, different uh, bioactive compounds. In environmental, as I told that water pollutants and uh, air, air uh, pollutants can be measured by using uh, this uh, technique alone. But uh, and in chemicals, the newly, compound, newly synthesized compounds can be measured and may be measured for the, uh, their uh, uh, purity. And uh, in pharmaceuticals, we already know that this is being measured for uh, already for, for quality control of raw materials to the end product. This has already been used for the uh, pharmaceuticals. And uh, with this, I want to conclude. The most important thing is we need to integrate both. HPLC as well as uh, mass spec together we need to integrate uh, for getting a better separation as well as to get a good sensitivity. So we will go with the next lecture. Yeah, thank you Dr. Ujwal. Now uh, our next speaker is again Dr. Dipankar. He will be briefing a very important aspect of the application of uh, mass. Uh, I request Dr. Uh, Malakar to present his talk on biomarker. Quantitative proteomics using Q-Traxis 5 Hello, unmute your mic. Can you able to see the presentation? That I... Yes, we are. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, so I will uh, discuss about biomarker quantitative proteomics using Q-Traxis 6500. Uh, system. So first of all, uh, uh, I would like to talk about protein biomarker research pipeline. So it comprising of discovery, verification and followed by very validation. If you see that the number of samples 
uh, also increasing from left side to the right side that means discovery to the validation part and also we need more throughput uh, for sample analysis because the number of sample increasing means instrument also capable of handling more number of samples with a short period of time so um, typically for discovery in instrument using a different technology like one is uh, 2d gel typically used uh, earlier days um, then uh, comes the mass spec label or label free technique for discovery then verification is protein quantitation by mrm um, the MRM is typical uh, considered to be gold standard for using mass spectrometry and then validation is the ELISA, ELISA assay, ELISA based assay or tissue antibody arrays, western blots. So these are the uh, different technology used for validation studies. Uh, but protein quantification by MRM also one of the um, studies the people uh, nowadays the people uh, scientists they follow this uh, technology, MRM technology. So, uh, decreasing number of in increasingly qualified biomarkers. So, that means from the left side to the right side, the biomarkers actually number is reducing, but the sample number is increasing. So, this is the typical biomarker research pipeline. Now, uh, there are different technology uh, using mass spectrometry we can use, like for discovery, we have eye track reagent or silex reagent for label based quantification uh, or differential proteomics analysis. Similarly, uh, for uh, discovery and in between verification, we have different workflow. Uh, one is called SWAT analysis, SWAT acquisition, MS, MS all, or MRM, HR, or PRM workflow. This is also used for high resolution platform and then there is another uh, MRM or schedule MRM. This is a new technology schedule MRM algorithm is used for verification and finally for validation uh, like MRM3 or MRM or Selex ion. This is a differential mobility spectrometry uh, that also used for validation purpose. Uh, so QTRAP, we can do MRM as well as MRM3. So MRM3 is more specific and uh, especially for matrix-based analysis, this, is, this will be another uh, important uh, assay, MRM3 assay. Now, this is the workflow for uh, QTRAP system for proteomics analysis, uh, like for peptide quantification. One is uh, the protein and peptide IDs, like uh, that is this discovery, then MRM assay development, and finally MRM assay. Uh, now, there, there is like uh, different software platform. One is called MIDAS, um, MRM initiated detection and absolute uh, uh, and, uh, and also uh, uh, detection. Uh, MRM initiated detection and absolute quantification uh, workflow, MIDAS, and then Skyline software. This is a third party uh, software. This is uh, also uh, universally nowadays used for uh, generating the MRMs from the sequence uh, given. And then we have a schedule MRM algorithm or MRM3 workflow uh, that can be used for MRM assay development. And then for MRM assay, we have a software called MultiQuant software. This is for absolute and quantification we can use this software. So the MIDAS workflow has an MRM initiated detection and sequencing using the MIDAS workflow. Here we have a, a scanning function called triple trap uh, scanning. So triple trap scanning means we can use triple word for MRM detection and trap for MSMS analysis, uh, subsequent MSMS analysis. So this will give uh, like good identity MSMS information. That means in MRM sometimes it can give spurious peak or false positive peak, but by using sub Subsequent MSMS will give rule out the false positive uh, detection. So this is a very good technology. You can able to use it for uh, Q-trap uh, kind of work, uh, hybrid instrument. So uh, for MIDAS workflow, we can able to get the sequence of the protein from the literature survey or from the some experiment we are uh, discovery experiment from the proteomic side and also some genomics data if it is there from that sequence can be protein sequence can be taken and uh, then they, this protein sequence can be theoretically or in silico we can break into peptide so see protein sequence can be we can break into peptide and then we uh, so this is called in silico MRM transition or I would say theoretical MRM transition where the parent mass and the corresponding fragment mass 
we can able to monitor a series of different peptides together we can able to generate the in silico um, uh, transition and then that we can able to run through the two trap system so we can able to see whether the theoretical uh, theoretical um uh, theoretical one and the practical how it is uh, going to match when we are running through the mass spec so mrm detection in a biological matrix so we can able to see lot of uh, peaks in a single pane uh, like percentage intensity versus time and then we can also do subsequent msms analysis so this is uh, one uh, example where the particular sequence apld nd ig v s e a t r r is the fine uh, so this is a triptych peptide because r gene terminating uh peptide and we can able to see this particular peptide is eluting at 16.88 minute and also we can able to break this particular peptide into uh, fragments and then we can uh, get the confirmation id I, uh, the id or identity uh, of the peptide can be confirmed by uh, doing this full scan msms so if the experiment in the mass spec we can design in such a way that we can able to get get the peak mrm peak of a particular peptide and also we can able to generate the msms spectra uh, to get the sequence confirmation of that particular peptide so this way midas workflow work like we can develop the mrm method in silico and then we can try to perform in the real time uh, way or we can perform in the uh, lcms analysis and get uh, get the identity of the uh, quantification so this this 16.88 minute will give you the quantification information and the msms will give you the qualitative information uh skyline software it is actually a, a free software and uh, it builds the multiple reaction mrm and uh, full scan multiple reaction monitoring and full scan quantitative method it also helps in building the method and analyze the resulting mass spectrometry data and this is a uh, downloadable from the website and free of charge so there is no charge involved in it and uh, there are the different vendors not only size but other vendors also the data can be um we can um, the skyline can support and uh, there are different algorithm like uh, schedule mrm algorithm uh, so this and also a multi quant method all this can be built in skyline so it is automatic process and it is user friendly also and uh, if somebody want to get training for this skyline software yes online there is a option that online training is available multi quant software is a sciex software and this is basically used for protein peptide quantization like absolute quantization as well as the relative quantization for biomarker verification or uh, validation studies support use of both unlabeled and stable isotopically labeled peptide internal standard handles large data sets that means you have many number of samples you are running and together you can able to load uh, all different set uh, all sample sets together in the software and analyze simultaneously powerful peak integration algorithm for most robust processing like single signal finder algorithm and also mq4 algorithm these are the uh, novel algorithm is there in the software to integrate the peaks to label the peaks to calculate the peak area calculate the percentage cb Uh, also the um, uh, signal to noise all these different information uh, can be uh, we can get from this multi quant software and this is a very intuitive powerful easy to use software comprehensive user interface for superior data visualization yes sometime some of the data can we can not um, like automatically software cannot perform better way sometime manual intervention also require require especially for very low abundant peaks those are very uh, maybe in the noise level so to detect that particular peak uh, sometime manual integration that option is also available in the software data queries to reduce and simplify manual review report generation and exporting result to other software packages so report and export result is possible to the other software and then 21 cfr compliance for pharma industry this is very important uh, so that is also available in the multi quant software 
Q-trap, uh, now coming to the Q-trap 6500 system, uh, the, what is the specialty in this system? This optimized geometry and new large diameter heaters in the ion drive source, turbo V source. This actually improved the ionization efficiency at higher flow rates. So now normally for, as I said, that for bi biomarker validation, we need to run the uh, with a very high throughput way, or we need to do the analysis with a very short period of time. So the flow rate can be in ml per minute. So in that case, to the source should be, geometry should be designed in such a way that it can handle high, very high flow rate analysis and uh, maintaining the ionization uh, nicely. And uh, then more robust source condition, higher the flow rate, better uh, the chance of contamination will be also very high in LCMS. So the source condition or the heating capability need to be improved in such a way that it can handle higher flow rate sample. Uh, efficiency gains in ion sampling with the ion drive QZ ion guide increasing sensitivity without compromising the robustness. Ion drive, this is a new uh, source and high energy detector increases the uh, uh, high ion counting capacity up to 24. Uh, greater than five orders of magnitude linear. So the dynamic range in the instrument is also very high. The dynamic range is typically, uh, uh, the higher dynamic range is good for quantitation. Low level to high level, we can able to quantitate the analyte. And the mass range is capable like five to 2000 M by Z scale. Uh, that is also provides versatility and high sensitivity for small molecule as well as for peptide because peptide will fall in the higher mass range. So this is one example where ion drive turbo V source in 6500, uh, 5500 actually the low one version lower instrument this is one example where we, we can able to uh, detect in atom mole level like 76 atom mole level with a very low C percentage CB like around 6 percent it is uh, we can able to get a good quantitation car uh, calibration graph. Uh, with the eight protein mixture. This is a high flow application. Flow rate is typically 500 microliter per minute with a 10 minute gradient. ID of the column is 2.1 millimeter. Uh, so this is a carbonic anhydrase peptide and getting very good low level like 76 atomol uh, on column injection. Uh, we are getting LLOQ. Similarly, uh, the dynamic range is uh, more than 5 point, uh, is around 5.5 orders. So from 10 atomol, that is the low, low Q, uh, that CB percentage is 13 percent. Whereas in the uh, uh, 550 lakhs atomol, that is the CB percentage is 1, that is the highest point. Uh, so we can able to get 5.5 5. 5 orders of linear dynamic range. 10 atomol is the uh, lowest limit of detection here. So using this instrument, we can able to uh, do like a lot of things. Like one is MRM, another is selection also can be coupled uh, with this instrument. So we can do DMS separation, uh, that is differential mobility spectrometry separation. And also we can perform MRM3. What is MRM3? The, MR, uh, the fragment of the uh, product. We can use that fragment of the product uh, for quantification. This will give more specificity uh, when we are dealing with a comple uh, complex sample or the sample having a lot of matrix interference. That is the real life sam challenging sample. Another thing is schedule MRM. This is also very important for especially for peptide uh, analysis because sometimes in one run we need to accommodate many different type, different number of different number of peptide like 4000 uh, MRM transition or 6000 MRM transition in a single run. So in that case, scheduling is important because cycle time is one of the important parameter we need to look at when we are dealing with quantitation. So because our objective should be for each of the peak, the number of data points should be more than 10. And then only we'll get good percentage CV, good reprodu reproducibility and the robustness in the assay. So, uh, schedule MRM is one of the uh, things because 4000 transition in one go in a normal MRM, we cannot get good number of data point for each of the transition or each of the MRM transition. Uh, so, we need to schedule it. That means we have to run a single MRM, different MRM experiment, uh, uh, different MRM transition, maybe one of the MRM, maybe 300 or 400 MRM in one run. 
uh, they, that way you can run like 10 times or 12, 15 times to accommodate all MRM, monitor the retention time for each of the MRM peaks and then we can feed all this retention time in the final method. This is called scheduling of the MRM. And we can able to, in a single run, we can able to uh, maybe 4,000 uh, transition together, we can able to uh, generate, uh, we can able to uh, monitor. Uh, so then if you have many different samples and you want to monitor this 4,000 transition across many different samples, it is possible to uh, do it. So initial method development takes a little bit of time because for each MRM peptide we need to monitor the retention time and then we need to feed in the final method uh, that particular retention time. So it maintains the cycle time and the dwell time and maintain analytical precision using this schedule MRM and it supports analyst software which is the 1.7 version it support this um, MRM high number of higher number of MRM transition like more than 4000 MRM transition now it is possible to uh, run through single run. So building the method as I said that you can able to see that there is a time one and uh, here the software algorithm automatically builds acquisition method organizes MRM based uh, on timing information uh, <coughs> automatically optimizes schema key parameter dual time cycle time and detection window and MRM trans expected retention time expected retention time with and target scan time this user need to need to provide uh, in the analysis software and up to 4000 transition can be monitored here and you can able to see that 2000 to 4000 there is no not much data loss or data quality uh, degradation um, yeah, so this is a 10 replicate analysis and giving getting very good reproducibility uh, within one minute MRM detection that means 60 second MRM detection windows. So this is all about uh, the presentation. Uh, yes, any question then? Thank you, Dr. Dipankar. It was uh, indeed a very interesting presentation about. Can you please uh, mute your uh, mic, Dr. Dipankar? So uh, thank you, Dr. Dipankar, for uh, elaborating like. Uh, the quantitative proteomics uh, by using QTRAP. So, coming to the last lecture of the webinar, that is, I will be briefing it's on it's very important for yeah, how, do you how to the approach head. our bioanalytics facility. Sir, please mute your mic. Dr. Dipankar, can you please mute your mic? Yeah, yeah I am. Thank you. I will give a brief overview on I want you to know how to take care of the health or the user. It's very important for Yes, this is, uh, you can see that our uh, bioanalytic uh, committee members, where this uh, team is led by Professor T. Pandian. And uh, by now, most of you know that where CCRF is located, it is in the ninth floor of the convergence block. And here you can see the floor plan. When you take this east end lift, you get inside the corridor. When you walk down uh, the proteomics and bioanalytics, it is on your right hand side at the end. And it's a combined facility which is uh, housing two mass spectroscopy, orbit trap, and Q trap 6500. And then uh, coming. It's not moving. So these are the three main instruments uh, which are uh, present in our facility. Already you are familiar with mass spectrometer. Already Dr. Hanuman has demonstrated. And uh, we have preparative HPLC. It is yet to be installed. Uh, this is basically to uh, when we want to isolate any compound from a complex matrix. 
and for example like any if you want to extract any phyto constituent from any plant product for that uh, this preparative hplc is mostly used uh, then we have analytical hplc it is yet to arrive to our uh, center now this is the most important slide where i will explain you the general workflow but before going to the general uh, workflow i would like to tell some important point here when you have your analyte uh, to be quantified you have two possibilities so in one possibility the already you know the method for the quantification is already reported in the literature so in that case you need to just adopt it and you have to do little modification of the method or else the second possibility is you, the method is completely new and in that case uh there are so many variables there are so many lc conditions there are so many mass uh, conditions so everything like you need to develop so that itself it's a you know huge work and itself it's a method development is a full paper so you can understand uh, the you know amount of work for you know developing some new method so in both the cases where the new method has to be developed and already a method is existing so both the cases validation of the method is very important step and it is mandatory and it will be done by following the us fda guidelines so after this uh, you need to book your uh, machine and then analysis will be done the data interpretation will be done by the scientist and it will be given to you so uh, now uh, if you see the overall uh, view of uh, the workflow you need to register first when you are coming for the first time to use the facility so when you go to the website of the ccrf you will uh see the bioanalytics uh, you know facility there you need to click and then upper right hand side you you see the registration box there if you click you will get a google form so you need to uh, write all about your, the details of your the name designation departments everything which are already there in the form so that and it will come directly to the scientist now you have to take the appointment uh, uh, of uh, dr hanuman who is the uh, scientist there and then you need to have a thorough literature search you have to consult you have to uh, you know discuss about your experiment and which is the analyte you need to be you know, like you, you analyte of your interest need to be quantified and when you know uh, whether it is a new method or method to be adopted from the literature directly you go for the estimation of the fund but in there are certain possibilities like certain cases where there is uh, some confusion some confusion in the sense some doubt whether this analyte can be you know uh, quantified in the machine or not so in that case you need to take a booking so the scientists will be doing uh, undergoing some preliminary analysis and when you get the green signal from the scientist then you go for estimation of the fund so after the online payment uh, or you can uh, like recently i think they must have created some bank account so after the payment confirmation your uh, the strategy the analytical strategy need to be developed and then the experimental will be uh, done further so this is just the overview and the timing as you can see that it uh, uh, functions from like 9:30 to 5 pm and saturday it's half working uh, and this uh, this uh, slide is showing the proposed user charges and as you can see that charges are different for three different instruments for uh, lcm sms it is uh, for every sample it is uh, 600 rupees and it includes all the solvents basic columns etc and for the validation the charges is more it is rupees 1000 rupees for every hour and these are the validation parameters and uh, for hplc it is uh, 20, uh, 50 rupees for every sample and 100 rupees for every hour and it, uh, this charges again include uh, the basic column like c8 c18 and helix and for flash chromatography the charge is rupees 300 every hour and the consumables for uh, it is uh, as, as per your requirement like uh, you might you have to get all the buffers solvents the different columns and uh, uh, center filters standards everything in, and uh, including internal standards so this is all about our facility and uh, we are always there to support you if you have any problem so i have already shared the Uh, email id that is bio uh, bioanalytics.ccrf@gmail.com thank you so much